We're talking bass fishing all day, all night. Presentation of God on the rock. I love you. Ultraverse comic books on sale today. Comic, comic book store. store. Let's go. They couldn't be there on 48 for the launch of that super guy, or in 62 for the launch of that spider guy, but they can be there now for the birth of the Ultraverse! Whoa! Mine! That way! Hard case, first editions in comic shops, June 16th. Hey, what's going on, YouTube? It's the brain of the mainframe here now, Scale with Pop XP. And tonight joining me is Dr. Blevins and Mr. JCV. Gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? Uh, not a doctor. Oh, yes, sir. Then stop carrying the prescription pad stick, around. Stick with that story, Blevins. I'm doing great, Niall. How are you? Doing I'm doing... Well. I, I'm well, man. I'm well. I'm excited. We finally got it on air again with some awesome guests uh, following up from our very first Pop XP panel. So I'm very excited about this. I know Dr. Blevins is 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 in a bit of a hoot. He's really excited to, uh, to get at it. And you know, it, he's chomping actually, away. We actually needed, like, the soap opera announcer today to say... <laughs> The role of Billy Tucci today will be played by Dr. Blevins. <laughs> by Dr. Brian Stephen Blevins. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Or and or you, as the case Blevins may be. Blevins will be now referred to as Dr. Blevins. The doctor. Well, you know, we did them a favor. We've got a fill-in for Billy tonight. That's there right. we go. So there's no well, true torture for that. Well, listen, no. The, the there real, was, the, the plenty, real great there thing was is, plenty of me to fill in, too, let me tell you. Let, let, let's oh. say the, the great thing is that, that uh, the doctor here has some legit fanboy questions to ask. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm hoping that many people from the uh, Ultraverse fan page on Facebook will pop in and ask us some questions in the comments as well. Absolutely. Uh, and we've got already, we've got TJ and Heroinberg and Lee and a whole bunch of our regular folks Coming out in. there. The fans on Facebook are starting to come in. We're seeing the tickers come up. That's right. That's, that's great. And so should we get started? Yeah. I think we should get started. Let's do it. So without further right. ado, JC, please introduce our lovely guest tonight. Let's let's bring in the former editor in chief of the Ultraverse, Chris Ohm, the former creative director, Tom Mason, and the former publisher, Dave Ulbrich. Hooray! Hey! 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 Thank you, <laughs> gentlemen. How are you doing tonight? Wonderful. This is great. Awesome, and welcome back to the show. We're very excited to have you. Yeah, we did it. We we had fun last time, so let's do this again. This is great. We're, okay. we're hoping to do good enough to come back for a third time. There you go. That's right, man. And you know, that, it's it's really good to get you guys back on, so I think we're going to have a good time. <laughs> I, oh, you I, say that now. <laughs> I, 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 have to, I have to say, when we do the third one, which one of you gets replaced by George Hamilton? Oh, I'll go. I'll be. I'll be. <laughs> How would you tell the difference? He's, uh, he, has, he has a better tan than I do. I'm just going to wear a sign that says, we'll work for beer. That's all you need. You still, have your, that sign. you still have your Letterman quarantine beard on, though. That's true. I do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You trimmed it up. Yeah, it looks they, they, won't, they, they won't. They, they won't. I, I had to buy a, a trimmer because the uh, the barbershop won't cut my beard. Really? Why they will they why they, don't don't they, have... they don't want me breathing on them. Oh, that's just wow. so lame. So you know, bad. I'm so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They could duct tape your mouth and trim the beard. <laughs> <laughs> don't think yeah. we haven't tried that. Yeah, right. You can go online and get you a Flowbee. There you go. For your beard. <laughs> what was it? What yeah. was it in Wayne's World? The suck cut. I'll leave that so, one alone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna let that lay there. <laughs> So, okay. gentlemen, how's it been since, you know, it's been about uh, what, a little over a month since you guys were on. Anything new, exciting happening? Yeah, yeah. I haven't left the house. Yeah. <laughs> Me either. I'm still in my garage, okay. as you can see. I, I, I took a summer vacation. I went from the dining room to the living room to watch a movie, and then I went back to the dining room. Oh, that's a nice well, we do have a weird yeah. We do have a weird piece of news, and Chris can probably fill this in a little bit better than me. But one of the public, one of the comics that we published back in the day is going to get republished. Really, Mr. Paul O'Connor's 
Bad Axe? Bad Axe. Bad Axe. It's going to get republished, and I, the name of the publisher evades me, but I'm sure there'll be a, a press release you can search on the internet sometime soon. You have to bring yeah. us back for a third time. We'll tell you all about it. There you yeah. go. Nice. Yeah. Oh, hey, way to dangle that carrot. <laughs> gotta give, yeah, gotta give him a little more, man. We gotta have well, that big cliffhanger. Yeah, know? we'll have to That's do right. our we we'll have to do our homework, right? <laughs> but yeah, Bad X is gonna get republished. So, and uh, is yeah. they gonna do any new content with it, or they're just republishing the original work? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But this know. that's a but that's a Malibu book, not an Ultraverse book. Right? That's so, true. That's so, true. So Dave, you really have no information beyond have, that, which makes it <laughs> that's the like the worst <laughs> announcement ever. The Ultraverse is still dead. That's all I got. I, I got a new pair of shoes is a better announcement than what you had. <laughs> well, there's your clicks. Ooh, yeah. it's the root and click. Root your clicks. I uh, I I will say that uh, in an off the record conversation. Uh, I asked somebody at Marvel about it, and the answer was, I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, but they don't. Well, it's, it's probably, I mean, like, in order to keep in order to keep it, they have to print it in some kind of form or fashion, right? Nah, uh, no, I, I, no, 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 nothing like that. And 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 it it there is a reasonable supposition that. Gaming stuff could be covered differently in the contract. Do you guys know anything about that? Like nah, not accurate. like non comic book stuff no. or non movie stuff. No, it's all it's all considered exploitation of of uh, it, it's under the category of et cetera or yet to be uh, invented. Yet to be yet I mean, to be yeah. thought of. But yeah. in, all, in all fairness, Jeff, the math was different across different in, you know across different categories, but the terms were the same. So well, somebody, yeah. so either way, somebody owes you guys like sixty-five cents. It, it maybe, yeah, at maybe, least. maybe, a, maybe, yeah. maybe a dime. Yeah. I'm talking about forty-nine cents, Tom. Forty-nine <laughs> cents. Everything. I'm I'm owed forty-nine cents by a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so there can't be any kind of ultraverse like RPG or anything like that. Well, well sure they could. Yeah. 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 All, yeah. I do, all I got to all I got to do is sign the paperwork, and away they go. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, they, they, don't have, they don't. They don't. They don't need to consider us in any way. Hmm. They, they can we, do whatever I mean, they want. We couldn't stop it if we wanted to. And would you want to? I want that forty-nine Probably cents. Not. I'd rather yeah. get the forty-nine cents yeah. at this point. Well, I was just saying earlier that uh, Ultraverse was on Amazon Prime. Like our uh, Ultra Force, right? Ultra Force was on uh, Amazon Prime, the cartoon series. And I was also oh, saying awesome. I was trying to I was trying to find it because I was told that it was it was produced on DVD, but I was unable to find it anywhere on DVD. Uh, you know, I found, you know, some of them were discontinued. Like I found the old Wildcats, yep. you know, series on, on DVD. You know, that was like the golden time. Every Everything during that time was getting a cartoon, mm -hmm. a TV show, a video game. Yeah. Like, I mean, like it was. Trading uh, cards. Yeah. Trading, oh, my God. The trading cards. And here, cards. And here trading I thought cards. Chuck Jones was the golden times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I was wrong. You're yeah. wrong. You that's, a, wrong. That's, that's a generational thing. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, like you know, just to just to jump in with some video game questions, if you don't mind, like, uh, so being a video game guy, which I don't know if you guys know this, but I, I used to be a professional video game player, uh, and I I, wow. I owned a I owned a game store and everything else like that, but uh, but you know, Prime had a video game through Sega CD, yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was packaged up with Microprose. Um, and you know, there was, there was not very many of them made. And, uh, like I just found out recently that back in 2011, they found a prototype for a prime super Nintendo game, which, uh, also apparently has this incredible soundtrack to it. But, uh, do you like, do you guys know anything about that stuff or why the games never came out or anything like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Oh, do, you know about the, do you know about the Super Nintendo prototype as compared to the the Sega? Why the Sega CD one came out and then the Super Nintendo one didn't? Yeah. Um, who wants can to you talk it? about it? Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about it? Yeah, yeah you just, can talk about it. He's just trying yeah. to figure out how to do that's it without. The, me. I think I think Tom should talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's, that's right. I'm in talking about it. I'm excited okay. to have Tom talk about it. He just doesn't yeah, want to break yeah, your yeah. heart. He just doesn't want to break your heart, Levins. <laughs> yeah, dude. Look, I, I got to play it earlier today, and I thought it was great. So oh, I mean, like Prime, Prime, ex he blows up and explodes, and then little yeah. kid falls out, and then it comes back together. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like I thought it was awesome. So Prime is a great character. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So absolutely. Here, 
here's broadly what what happened is that we had a comic book division and a video game division and the idea was that we would license out the comic books to be made into video games by Sega or Sony or Nintendo or whomever and then those studios would then have to hire our video game company to actually make the games. So basically we could double dip. We'd get a licensing nice. fee and then we get hired to make the games. As somewhere along the way um, is where this gets complicated is the video game division decided, oh, let's cut out that step where people pay us and let's self fund the video games because these are boom times and we can have more control and more whatever over our own games. Well, well Tom, I will interrupt for a minute. We did have a deal with THQ. Yes, that's true. We did. Right. And and then THQ went out of business. And then is that when we decided to self-fund at that point? Some some executive decided we had to capture the vertical. We have to capture all the pieces of the vertical. <laughs> so at the, at the time that THQ went out, did someone not buy their assets or buy their stakes and, and able to absorb that contract? Yeah, you might that might have been optional. If you know what I'm saying. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that happened in some cases. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> not, not in this one. Not in our not case. So, yeah. So we decided, and when I say we, I mean not me and not Chris and not Dave. Um, we decided to self fund the video games, and we had Prime, and we had Firearm, and we had one other one uh, that were in development. And the idea was that we would sell them to uh, certainly the Prime one. Uh, I think Sony was interested in yeah. picking up the Prime one once it was done. Um, but, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, the video game division developed the games for a format that was rapidly going out of date quickly. Yeah, it was just at the time we were doing the PS1 transition. Hmm. Right. It was just, and, the PS1 was still like kind of in the lab, uh, just, just about to come out. And so y'all had the develop y'all had the blue developer kids. Yeah, so, so stuff. nice. So so our team was uh, was sixteen bit guys, right? That's it was small teams being able to do sort of you know fighters and and uh, side scrollers, and we and that was going to full three D. So that was the other thing we, that transition was coming out, which you know sank a lot of a lot of uh, video game companies at that time. Right, and so and that's that's pretty much what sank the prime uh, video game is that. Uh, when Sony saw it, they were like, now we're, we've left that technology behind. Now we're doing this technology. If you guys want to try to convert it, we'll do it. And that ended up with a very sort of limited edition Sony CD that came out at the time. And no further games ever came out. And then we sold to Marvel. And Marvel was like, ah, we don't make video games. Mm -hmm. So... Hmm. Now, when you guys developed the games, though, was it being done within the states and overseas, or was the whole development was, team? Was, uh, the the whole development team is right in the same building as the comic book publishing team. Well, that's just pretty awesome. the same building. Just, yeah, it was. A, it was. It was a great. I mean, honestly, it was. A, it was a great hall. idea. Yeah, it was a great business idea at that time, especially you know to, mm -hmm. to build the IP and to to build the games at the same time. Um, it's just you know it requires a lot of. Uh, pieces to fall into place to make that work was was the yeah. funding there for all that was the no. funding really there to oh no <laughs> yeah. no, no it wasn't no, Brian, did, no. You, did you did you miss no, the but, part where we had to sell to marvel yeah, <laughs> yeah. well i didn't uh, i didn't know the reason behind all that a, a fair way might be to say yes and no <laughs> yeah. so let me let me let me ask you guys a question um one of the things that i really enjoyed from our last conversation was your way that you described as marketing uh, always organically being involved in the process uh, as opposed to like, hey, market this after the fact or the opposite of, hey, you guys need to create this. Right, uh, right. So it was always organically part of it. Did that go along with the interactive part or was that because I principal of the company said hey you're gonna have this division. there was there was an attempt to do that. We wanted to, to do that more but um, I think the businesses were so different. The publishing business was so different from the game development business at the time that there wasn't a lot of uh, overlap and synergy in terms of who knew what to do on either side of that divide. But we also, I think we had input in determining that the first game would be Prime, oh, another, yeah. game, another game would be Firearm, because those are, based on the other games that were coming out at the time, those were like logical properties to turn into a game. Right. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, The Strangers is not necessarily a good video game for 1993, 
Mantra is not necessarily no. a good video game for 1993, but Prime, Firearm uh, are, are within the target. Entirely, yep. entirely hypothetical, of course. But if you were in the same position of starting the Ultraverse right now, mm -hmm. is that is this process with the video games easier? Oh, geez, I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, for me, for, if if you're asking me personally, yeah, because I've been developing games for the last 15 years. Yeah, well, so that's actually I, that's I, actually that's actually why I'm asking Chris. Yeah, because yeah, so I also I, think I, that I also think parts of the technology, understanding it for comic creators, story wise are easier now yeah yeah so yeah, that, that's what i was asking about yeah i think so i think for sure if we were launching the ultraverse today we would have you know a licensing division that would be we'd be able to call people out on their bs right we know which developers could really do a great job and what kind of games would actually work um whereas before we had to sort of take everybody's word for it because that wasn't right. our expertise right. right do you do you think in this kind of climate that the the actual physical books could actually sustain uh are, are would you have to keep them separate would you have to keep the comic book money and the video games separate because most of the time you know you would use the money from the comic books to help fund the video games I or, think just or the opposite or, or, or the vice opposite vice. yeah 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 it would be upside down now right i, I don't know if i'd have an integrated development slash publishing company that might be a lot to pull off and require a lot of uh upfront funding yeah, to make yeah, that I was happen. Like, I was like, you definitely would you definitely would want to separate them. Or it well to me, I don't think I don't think you can say definitely. I think you have to say it's situational because you right. might come in with a high net worth individual who has mm -hmm. this vision of how to do this and is willing to spend what it takes to do it. The other side of it is you might spend all your time trying to convince everybody that you know, you're more than just an IP generator for video games. Yeah, right. Well, right. And, the, and the trick is always command and control, right? I mean, that was the thing that managed to get Malibu through the, the, the lean days and our command and control really helped um, make sure that the launch went properly and all the stuff got mm -hmm. integrated the way it was supposed to and adding the games um made that significantly more difficult and i think it's it would still be difficult today to but there's integrate that stuff the way you wanted to but there's also i think this sort of builds on what jeff was saying there's also a, a a large part of the comic book direct market which is that if you're if you're building up a line of comic books organically you're sort of welcomed into the club mm -hmm. whereas if you start a line of video games and then say oh we're going to make some comics you're sort of looked at as the outsider and um True. and so i think it's it's better if you want to actually be a part of the direct market to create some comics that work as comics first and then sort of figure out if there's a game component to be had right. sure yeah. I, I think one of the one of the key things yeah. there is um you know we've all had licensed comics that we love you guys did a bunch of them pre ultraverse yes and, and uh, dave's been on my my licensed comics panel at san diego and you know there's there's tons of beloved ones like rom and micronauts and star wars and things like that but there's also you know uh ones let's say less uh, well, mo most, than that. most of them right the, yeah. the really good ones are the anomalies the, the the landscape is strewn with the corpses of the bad ones yeah yeah and i and i think that that uh comic book fans and retailers uh, uh are pretty savvy about that. Hey, Niall, could we bring up uh, Mob Seat's comment? Since Billy's not here, we really should address this very quickly. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> here, Mr. Tucci, I invented the Fury character. Change it or be sued. Signed, Homer. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what happened? What happened is uh, Mob Seat. Touche. That's that's lovely. Thank well, you. Let me, uh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why this is so great. <laughs> Thank you, Mob Seed, by the way. Mob Seed's the best. <laughs> um, Billy received an email this afternoon saying from the creator of Miss Fury, <laughs> threatening to sue him. Who was that exactly? Yeah, well, uh, threatening to sue him. Yeah. And, 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 and there would be consequences oh, if, he, if, if he didn't oh, change no. the name to Black Fury. Uh, um, <laughs> and, and it. Honestly, I just right before the show, I sent him a text. I said, "Is this email real?" 
if so, this is the best thing I've seen all day because today was a long, <laughs> long day. Well, then, I, zombies do exist then. The best thing I like days. about that message is that somebody that knows that Malibu published Miss Fury first, I mean, not first, but after it was already PD and that was 25 years ago. Yeah. Oh, and, that's right. really hysterical. That's really funny. And, funny. And, and, you know, and there's, and the great thing is, you know, this is like, you know, Google could probably help you find out that there's this character. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a guess. At any rate, since Billy's not here, I thought we should acknowledge that and thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that uh, was Mom, great. Steve, for this. Well, well done. Nice. So, hey, who worked on our Miss Fury books, Tom? Was that? That's, Lorraine uh, Haynes had something to do with that at some point along the he way, did right? The, he did the covers. I believe Roland Mann did the writing, and I yep. thought and the editing too. And, Mitch, the, and I and I thought Mitch Bird did the art. Mitch, Mitch probably did. The yeah. Art. Ah, and, yeah, and you're yeah. and you're that, that guy. That guy's an unsung hero, by the way. Just saying. Yeah, and, and and Bird's is really it, talented. Is it your Miss Fury that's in the poster on the wall in uh, in the Hunters TV show, also on Amazon? Like, ah, uh, you have to show me that. I, yeah, I, I watched I the whole thing and I didn't see the poster. So in, in the comic book shop, it's uh, right you know, up near the up near the desk on the right hand side. You know, at, at stage stage right. Right. You know, or, wow, so, that, uh, that's that's, some, that's some memory there, Doctor Blevins. Good for you. Yeah. Oh, I saw it. And I was nice like, job. wow. Well, I mean, you know, it's somebody who fought Nazis. You know, <laughs> and it was a right? comic book True. shop, so I'm like, they had to put something in there. Sure. And it was so crazy because that because I saw that and then you know Billy. Did the announcement of Miss Fury, and I asked him, and he's like, you know, it's not the same generation Miss Fury. It should have been, but they used the later version of Miss Fury and not the Tarpe Mills version. Yeah, but somebody was smart enough to know that that was a Nazi yeah, fighter that was public absolutely. domain. How cool is that? And they could get a poster for it. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's pretty savvy for a TV, um, you know, set decorator. That's yeah. Well, like, it's Dave, Dave, it's I just like sorry, Tom. I, that's it, uh, but. Dave, I'd just like to say, if you had that many millions of dollars per episode, you and I could figure it out. Yeah, but they usually don't. That's the, I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not saying they couldn't figure it out. I'm saying they just usually don't bother. No, I'll yeah, give you except, that. Except that now, what you're seeing is a lot of people in show business are actually second generation comic book fans. So right. before, that's true. Before, if, if this was the '90s, let's say, then you would have a hard time finding a person who was a set decorator who knew how to get a comic book poster. Yeah. You'd, right. it'd, be, it'd be like one or two people. Now it's probably 15, 20, 30 people, and there's a whole network of people who know how to get some comic books, how to get some stand-ups, how to get some posters to decorate a set. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and and um, Hunters was pretty comic booky to begin with, so. Mm -hmm. All right, I've got a I've got a question that I'd like each of you to answer in turn, and Dave, we'll uh -oh. start with you. Oh, God. <laughs> well, thank goodness. You ready? <laughs> yes. I'm ready. All right. Uh, I know we personally together have done a bunch of panels. You've also done it at WonderCon and things like that. And we've been to many shows since the days of the Ultraverse. Yep. What's the best comment you ever heard from a fan about what they felt about the Ultraverse? Oh, best man. comment I got from a fan about the Ultraverse. Um, oh, geez, that's... Yeah, I don't generally talk to a lot of fans. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's not fair. That's that's not. Even I, I realize you don't like people. No, not at all. Just, yeah, me. Yeah, just look at the it three of us. By the way, I'm the one that likes people. Just saying. <laughs> Wait um, a minute. He says that now. <laughs> yeah. Um. Come on. You can do it. Probably that they were really grateful that I mean that they could come in on the ground floor. I mean, that was the thing that we kept hearing over and over again is like all this stuff has been rehashed over and over again. It's nice to read something that's both fresh and familiar, and we appreciate the effort to be to make it cohesive. So okay, I think I think good. that's what we heard the most about the ultra. I like that. I mean, Tom, how about I you? Fans. I heard I heard uh, thank you for giving Steve Gerber a job, and that came from <laughs> Steve Gerber. <laughs> 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 Chris? Uh, oh, I'm up? Okay. Oh, you're going to let him get away with that? No, All I'm right. not. <laughs> All right, fair enough. The, the, the best thing that I heard was uh, from, from, from one of the closest fans to me was, Daddy, that scares me. Turn that picture around. <laughs> on my, uh, my picture of room that I have on the wall. Yeah, that, uh, 
but but since then they've all become comic book fans to one degree or another, and so they've they've got a chance to to actually dazzle their friends with, hey, my dad used to do this. Not not that what I do now matters, but you know what I did right. then matters. Yeah. Sure. Right. Well, well, I definitely would love to say since I never got to say this to any anybody, like uh, I thought some of the stories for the for the Ultraverse were incredible. And to this day, like, I mean, I've read so many stories from everything. I'm talking about novels, everything. To this day, the the best short story that I ever read was the Lord Pumpkin Ashcan from, the, <laughs> from, he, from Hero from Hero Magazine. Sure. From Hero Magazine. It was it was not Lord, you know, I went nice to, way to, to not mention Overstreet. Yeah, I went to I went to try to I went to try to find it. Well you don't you don't have comic you didn't have it in your comic books, did you? Did you JC? All right. So so basically I wanted to I I got this story and man it just it blew me away and it made me go get the book. And uh, the story was, you know, this this fairy tale story about this prince who wanted a friend, and you know, one of one of the local wizards made a made a friend for him to play, and it was like this happy go lucky story, you know, about a child getting a friend, but the <laughs> but the but the uh, you know, but the art, the the story in art was he was this violent kid that was killing people. And everything, and then you know, like, like basically, they made this, you know, Lord Pumpkinhead to just withstand and take all this abuse from this prince until just one day he's like, "I'm not going to take it anymore." <laughs> and that story to this day is still like the best short story that I read. So that's written by Dan Danko, and that's yep. actually his childhood. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was going to say it's kind of the story of Malibu. I'll like uh, you know. <laughs> Hey, here's a great comment. Hey, look, Jason's so, here. Yeah. Hey, Jason Jason Moore. hey, Jason. How you hey, doing, guys. buddy? That's hey, so guys. Cool. Great Jason. to see you all. I used to uh, be an inker for Malibu. Worked on Rune, Mantra, Codename Fire on Freaks. Uh, great okay. times. Worked a lot with good friend Kyle Hotz. Hotz. Nice. Yep. Is it nice Hotz? I think it's Hotz. Is it Hotz? I don't know. I thought it was Hotz, but I could Hotz. be wrong. Hotz. No Kyle Hotz. Hotz. Yeah, no, that's... That's, That's very been, cool, Jason. Gonna... Thanks for coming on. TJ yeah. James. Oh, oh, this really this really would have been a great game. Yes, yeah, it, yes it would have. I agree. It, I agree with TJ. Yeah, it would have been, been a great game. game back then. But man, would it be a cool game now? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the production so with video games right now. I mean, because now video games, it's like producing a movie. Really, I mean, yeah. with your, you have A-list actors that now are even you know C generated in CGI, modeled and everything. I mean, to actually, if it had the capabilities, I think that'd be incredible to see, especially some of your ultraverse characters and what they could do with video games today. Oh yeah, yeah we loop. could really bring them to life now. Oh my but you god! Could also, did we, did we lose we, Jeff? Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. But you could also do a yeah, oh, you I'm fine. But you could also do a, a a video game that's on the level of of. Fortnite or Call of Duty or whatever, yep. but you could also you could also do one that's like Runestone Crush, where it's just mm -hmm. you know, it's just the runes dropping down from the top of the frame into Rune's mouth or whatever. So you could do a simple. <laughs> you could do, that's a great pitch, Tom. Run this is bring you along next time. This is why I don't design <laughs> video games. No, but you could, there's, there are many different ways yeah. you could exploit a property. No, you're right. But a Spider-Man level you, RPG would have been very cool on, on you've Solid got, Air. Oh, yeah. Yes. Tom, Tom, you yes. clearly there you go. have a... Oats. Hoats is Oats. pronounced Oats. like Oats. Okay. Oats. Oh, there we go. Thank hey, you. Jason. I, I'd, I'd like to say yes, I was correct about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> the, the, the guy who didn't God, Jason's always okay. right. So yeah, that's, why he's, that's why he's <laughs> the master... That's why he's the master <laughs> editor. The, yeah. the score now is Dr. Blevins <laughs> 3. <laughs> Jason Vaughn 1. Jason Vaughn to keep a score. <laughs> The, so, uh, oh, the, 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 the thing for me uh, about the video games that's appealing uh, as a non-video game guy is that it's it's another way of reaching new fans and introducing them to comics. So that's what I that's what I like about oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Um, were you guys? I mean. It's a bit, you know, the 90s is a bit early to have everybody running around calling it IP. But were you guys thinking like, hey, multimedia stuff? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Was, that was, that was at the very root one. of everything we were doing. 
from out right. of the gate out of the yeah. gate yeah and, and that way we were we were on top of it well the, tr hard. the trick is to be able to ha make the properties available for that kind of exploitation but still maintain a sense of authenticity and that's what tom yeah. was talking about if you start them off as quality ip with some sort of authentic thread that runs through them the readers and the people respond to that and then you can spin it out from there whereas opposed to if you start somewhere else and shove it into a comic it tends to lose that sense of authenticity mm -hmm. and i think the readers can sense that and yeah. and also there's a there's a Great point. almost all of this is set up like a, a series of steps and so if you start out with uh trading cards for example and then you have video games and then you have a cartoon show and then you have this other stuff all of a sudden you, you hope that you're making movies and then you're making more tv shows and then everything just sort of snowballs and you become you become a thing as opposed to just comics and so mm -hmm. that's we were trying to build upwards as quickly as we possibly could in order to get movies made that's really amazing <laughs> yeah like what was was that the hardest pitch was mantra the hardest pitch to try to get no. into a comic book? oh wait no oh, no it, no. It's, the, it's the easiest pitch to get as a comic book. It's the hardest pitch to get made into anything else. Yeah. Gotcha. It's and, like a man trapped in a woman's body. It's like, oh, right. no. Yes. Oh, <laughs> hi, Michael. Look who's here. Yes. Benvati's here. Yay. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will tell you, this is seven days' growth of beard on my <laughs> I'll be the Frank Beard of this group. <laughs> uh, so... Um, and uh, now I forgot the question. <laughs> oh, it was uh, was Mantra the hardest thing to get to get uh, made? Uh, and you were like, no, no. Well, that was a great thing about comics. We could do every else. we could do everything as a comic, right? I mean, there was no there was no budget consideration. There was no like story that was too strange or weird. We had some or we had some crazy stuff that was in our um, in our Ultraverse Bible that we were going to bring in at some point or another in terms of there's, the overall yeah, universe. There's a Drunk lot of so, stuff in the Bible that never saw the light of day or only that, was, it was only that, a trading card or something mm -hmm. and it could have been very, very cool. Yeah. Do, we, do we talk about Drunken Magician at this point? Yeah, sure. well, that, yeah let's. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Tom. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Tom. What was, what was Drunken Magician? Yeah, Tom, uh, what you know, was the Drunken Magician? What was that, Tom? Drunken Magician. Is, thank you for asking. Uh, Drunken yeah. Magician <laughs> was, a, was a pitch from Steve Gerber. Um about a like a Doctor Strange type character who had superpowers, but they only increased in power the more he drank. This and came so, up. At, this came up at the uh, the the founders conference, right? Yes, it, yes, oh, yeah. it, did. it was one of the yeah. original ones, and 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 we all loved it because it's so stupid, but it's funny, <laughs> and um, it just never got. Uh, Gerber took a a, a a pass at building it out. I think Engelhart added some mm -hmm. to it. Um, yeah. And it just it just never became a thing where somebody should say, "Oh, let's do four F four Miss You Mini series of Drunken Magician," because I, nobody. I think, I think what ahead. killed it, Tom. If I think I remember right, what killed it was we are planning on putting these on the newsstand. Yes, that's right. And so having somebody that had to drink all the time <laughs> was going to be a, a little bit of a hard, a harder sell at uh, you know Seven Eleven. Well, and also also the the key was that. Nobody could figure out a way. I mean, admittedly, nobody spent a ton of time on it, but nobody could figure out a way to make it any different than Drunken Master from Jackie Chan. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things that you just sort of stumbled on there, Chris, <laughs> right. was was really it was a shortcoming on the marketing side because at 7 Eleven, you guys could have like branded it with beer. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> could have been, uh... have been visionary like that. Yes. <laughs> the, the course. Finish the, the bottle to get to the rest of the story. <laughs> the Budweiser magician. Yeah. 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 Like, like, like they could have had pogs at the bottom of the beer. You had yeah. to finish there it. There you go. Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> so you're, you're putting this all together right now. You're good at this. I like it. And, 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 and you're like, and you're, it's like choose your own adventure by which beer you drink first. And and in his utility belt, he had beer goggles. Oh, nice. <laughs> hey guys, yeah. did we ever end up using the Bash Brothers for anything? The Bash had, Jose, it, Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire. <laughs> we, had a, we had we had a, we had a couple of characters that were basically aliens who came to Earth accidentally, and they're trying to, you know, yeah, figure their way around. The problem is. They could only relate to the world through physical contact. 
Mm -hmm. So they were constantly hitting each other, hitting walls, hitting whoever was near them, because that's the way they related, and they didn't understand why any of this was bad. <laughs> and so they were, you know, they were. I thought they were really cute characters, but we, I don't know if we ever did much with them. I'm trying to remember, Dave. I, I don't. I, maybe some Ultraverse fan out there. Maybe we've called. I bet we called attention to them, or we may have mentioned them in one of the comics mm -hmm. as I a backstory it. element. And I yeah. thought Don. I thought Don Simpson did the trading cards. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah. You're yeah, exactly they, right about that's that. That's right. I know that's why I remember them. They were in the trading cards. Right, and they look. They look so. But there, were, there's a lot of stuff like that that we put right. in the trading cards or in the Bible that we just said, "Oh, let's get to that." And then, yeah. you know, for reasons we never just got to them. We basically oh, built we up like 20 years worth of material. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's, 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 there's trading cards by PK pre Craig Russell of characters I don't think we ever used too. Which oh, there's lots of them. Lots yeah, yeah, of yeah. Great, what lots was of you, do you have a favorite unused character, Chris, that you can think of just off the top of your head that you can describe to people? Jeez, uh, come back to me on that. Let me think about it. Let me see if I can think of one. Tommy, you got one besides the drunken magician? No, that's my go to. That's, that's, that's a go to. <laughs> yeah. That just kills yeah. me. I feel like that would really work today, especially with some it's of the stuff you see on like God. Netflix and stuff like that. <laughs> I think that would make a great show. Isn't that, <laughs> Kyle, you're really onto something there. I mean, can you, like, that would work. For all the reasons they yeah. said, it's a, it's a hard sell in the 90s right now. Now right it's now. not that much different than Happy, right? At yeah. some level. Yes. Except it was some level, level, yeah. Uh, all right, I have one. Except I think it I think it was Larry Niven's character that could park a car perfectly <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, so so I'm the so one I was actually there. I was actually thinking about this <laughs> recently, and I think you could do something really cool because it wasn't just that he could I mean it manifested that he could park a car anywhere, <laughs> but actually he was uh, he had the ability to to arrange space. Right, and right. so we could actually turn that like from a ridiculous power into something that became more and more interesting over time. I think there was there was something there that we could have done with that with that character. Uh, that so was, we had, we had all sorts of like I mean people came up with with just crazy great things, and I really wanted to have more more adventures on that giant disc world too that that Larry had created. Did uh, did all that stuff get sold to Marvel as well? All that. All the, the unpublished we, stuff. We tied yeah. it. We tied it in a bow and yeah. handed it them very nicely. There's, there's yeah. a legal term uh, called lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah. Uh, 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 yes, Tom. Uh, I, I I don't know if that's true. Oh, interesting, Tom. Oh, hey. What what, what, because, what is Tom saying? Because what are you saying, Tom? Dun, dun, dun. Well, uh, uh oh, we're about to, <laughs> we're about to see some new tell, Tom. Because there is Pulse there feed, Pulse feed. Tom Mason Pro Camp. There is a there is a weakness in the contract where the stuff that's in the Bible that was never officially Exploited. signed up and executed may belong to the actual people that pitched. Oh, it, it. might have reverted because yeah. of time. Yeah, no, that's true. Right. So yeah, because. Right. That's right. We did talk about. We, that. we like to, we like to think of it as a strength in the in the contract, Tom, not a weakness. Tom would side with the empire. It's, it's, right. it's my it's, it's my background that I would side with the empire. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a possibility that because drunken ma drunken magician never was developed was never to the point right. was never published, but also. Never had there a character no, design or anything like that. There was either. no character design. There was no character interest agreement generated for that particular character from the Bible. What what does that really mean? I mean, you have to get a lawyer because I only play one here on the internet. But <laughs> yeah. um, what does that really mean? Jason's so, got, a great, Jason's got yeah. a great question here. And it, there was one of them that was on eBay <laughs> recently, wasn't there, Tom? I know, wasn't there, that I, what we were talking I know about there was on? one floating around somewhere as a PDF and it had like a million pages, but I thought I saw one floating around the internet somewhere, but I can't for the life of me. There, it's somebody on uh, the in the Facebook Ultraverse group posted a version of the Bible, which is early because I think it only had like a hundred pages. By the time was it still called the Megaverse, Tom? Do you remember? No, no, no. That okay. was like, after that. That, that okay. was one point. That was one point oh or whatever. This was like one point yeah. four or one point five. Okay. Um, by the time I think of nineteen ninety five rolled around. The Bible had grown from a hundred pages to like well over four hundred pages, and it had to be in a three ring binder. And so yep. everybody, everybody in the office had these massive three wing three ring binders on their desks. Um, but I don't think anybody has actually gone through and scanned all four hundred pages. Was yeah. that um, was that Curtis's job to update the pages? Was yep. that one of Curtis's jobs? Uh, yeah. Well, it was it was three guys. I think it was Curtis. 
it was uh, Jason Levine, Jason, yeah, Jason and Levine. It, it was and it was Steve Lowry because those mm -hmm. guys. Um, they were the experts, basically. What, they were, they were what, keeping what track of Kurt, everything. What was, what was Curtis's last name again? Fujita. Fujita. Oh, okay. How do you forget that? I didn't forget it. I was being cagey. <laughs> I was being cagey. I was trying to get somebody to say Curtis's whole name so when he watches this, it'll get him to pop. Now he's so excited he doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> I, so I think you, I think you, you think forgot. You think I forgot, didn't, don't you? You're I, I've known wrong. you for 35 years, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. yes. So just just so I get this trade, just because I want to make sure that I haven't mistaken anything, confirmed this holiday season was a magician on Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Is that what you're saying? It's only a matter of time. Confirmed. Right. Yes. I just hope I get invited confirmed. to the Netflix Locked premiere. In. <laughs> well, credit where it's due is it was all Steve Gerber. That's, yes, uh, you know, that, that great idea, and uh, we've never been able to forget it either. No, no. no it's, 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 it has the whole. There's a whole page on it in the Bible. Dude, that sounds awesome. Do you guys? Do any of you guys still have a copy of the Bible? I have a copy of the version that existed at the launch. Mm -hmm. I used to have a copy of the massive 400 page thing, and I don't know what happened to it. I think it got. Uh, I became disassociated with it during some move. Um, I know there are people that do have it. I'm pretty sure Chris and Dave have it locked away somewhere in one of their storage units. I know I Roland. Think I have it. I, I know Roland Mann it. has one. Yeah, um, I've got I, boxes of Ultraverse stuff I haven't gone through in 20 years. I'm I'm pretty sure Dan Danko has one locked away somewhere. Yeah. Um, so they, I mean, they exist. Could you guys public? Could that be published, or would that be go against uh, anything? I, I, well, we don't we don't own Ultraverse, so I don't think we could publish it fairly. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't think, and it would it would not be in our best interest legally to scan it and give it to people. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could sell your personal copy to somebody because yeah, it's, right. because it has its yeah. extent in your papers. But yes. other but other than that, you couldn't take any publishing action. It would take right. at least a million dollars to pry it out of my hands. <laughs> <laughs> just I, just okay. saying, there's a price out there. Ryan's like sold. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like that's not too shabby of a price. <laughs> He does have steel. I do have a question uh, about the the trade paperbacks I was showing earlier. Yes. Did you guys have plans to do more? Yes. Yes. And yes, what, what's and what stopped you? Was it? I regret deeply that we didn't do more. Yes. I really yeah. wish. There, I really wish there was one of firearm. Well, that, right. that was we, kind we, of the plan was to was to build four and five issue story arcs and then repackage them as graphic novels. That was. That was sort of our go-to move at that. Oh, we at, at that we time. didn't want the publication yeah. of the graphic novels to be too close to the release of the comics because we right. didn't want people. We wanted to minimize the amount of people going. Ah, I'll just wait for the trade. Yeah, if you'd given us five years, we would have taken over the world. But yep. you know, the <laughs> two or three, we didn't really have enough time. Let me. Yeah, uh, we... Let me. Let me ask this about the sale, if you don't mind. Like at the time, I, I mean, obviously, you sold the you sold the Marvel. Like, was there was. Was there a bidding war, or was it just like this is what's happening? Let's go into market. The, the, the only two, the only two war, there was a skirmish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the only two, the only two comic companies that could have really bought us were both interested in buying us <laughs> at the same right. time. Well, so these, uh, DC and Marvel, right? And there weren't any other major players at the table. No, but we had we had entertained. Uh, well, we had gone out to. Saban Entertainment at one point, and we had gone out to Fox, and and sort of, you know, seen yep. if there was interest, and there wasn't. And then DC expressed an interest uh, around April of '94, and we negotiated with them uh, up until October of '94, and then Marvel sort of swooped in at the last minute and said, "Oh, we'll pay, we'll pay more for you, because it's in it's in Marvel's best interest." And cash and, because they were public at the time and they were rolling in it because of all their trading card companies and all the other collectible stuff. So their stock had gone nuts. Oh, Holy right? moly. Anybody want a $600 version of the Ultraverse Bible? Yes. I got to say, I think the one the, the, look Tom was answering about the other day, one was like the, was a, what was it? Like an Ultra Force story Bible? Yeah, it was one, from the, from the cartoon, which is oh, from the cartoon. Ah, okay. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah there's, that's a completely different thing, yeah. There's that Ultraverse Bible that's one of the very early versions, and then there's the Ultra Force animated cartoon show Bible, mm -hmm. which we didn't put together. That wasn't right. from the office. That came from the animation studio. That's right. right. Um, well, let me, let me ask you guys. I mean, you've got so many fans out there. You know, So many people grew up with your work. They know what you've done. They know the works you did. So what are you all doing now? We'll start with Dave. Oh, okay. Um, I'm actually a software product coach. So um, I have a stay-at-home job. My wife is retired, so it's a, it's, 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 it's a great gig. Uh, I'm certainly uh, interested to talk to anybody who wants to uh, put my geek skills to work, but currently that's not the case. I, yeah, I know. I oh. know. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff will hire me when he gets the money. I'm not worried about that part. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I write and create TV shows for animation, some live action and stuff like that. I was a story editor and head writer uh, for a TV show out of Italy called Bat Pat. We just wrapped production on that about a year ago. I just developed two TV shows before the coronavirus hit um, that are waiting for funding. I did some coronavirus PSAs. Uh, for a, a charity to help keep kids calm about washing their hands and not touching their face. Mm -hmm. And um, I developed, I created a show for the BBC. I've done work for Nickelodeon. I've done work for uh, whatever. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. Nice. Chris? Video games. So I've been doing games, interactive stuff for, I don't I, I want to say 15 years, but I think that's wrong. I think it's longer than that. And, uh, you know, we created uh, some studios out here in San Diego, so High Moon Studios that has since gone on to do um, uh, Call of Duty and some other things. Um, and uh, Machine Zone, we sold a company to Machine Zone. I was working for them for a brief period of time. And uh, uh, I was doing my own thing for about nine years where we had a company called Appy Entertainment when, the, when mobile first took off. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of jumped into, into that, which was really interesting. So now I'm working at one of the big mobile casual companies, which is called Jam City. So they're out here in, in San Diego, and I've been there as the creative director for about three years now. Mm -hmm. And, and I, haven't been out of the, like I haven't been I haven't been out of the game very long. Just a couple of years ago, I was helping Space Goat put out those uh, Evil Dead Two yeah. comics mm -hmm. by by uh, Mr. Um, uh, Frank Hanna yeah. and mm -hmm. and, the, and the a variety of artists. And Frank did the most amazing job reimagining ash in a little yeah. tiny box mm -hmm. that was really hard to get out of and it, those comics were really terrific and under that, that was a pretty restrictive license because it was specifically off of evil dead 2 right right you could we couldn't get one and we couldn't get army of darkness those were taken <laughs> so we had to find some way to not dance in either world and somehow keep it restrained to evil dead 2 and it really and like i said frank did a miraculous job of creating this incredibly compelling story. I think we ought to, the next time we do the licensed comic panel, we really ought to dwell on that a little because that is, a, <laughs> that, is that really is a challenge. I, mm -hmm. I thought uh, Jim Kohorik, when he was writing Army of Darkness for Dynamite, did the uh, most outstanding job of capturing Ash's voice. But he did it with a lot, like you could do Army of Darkness, then imagine what comes after, which gives you a lot more room to wiggle around. Right. Than, than saying, hey, you, you're licensing Evil Dead 2. Here, do 27 miniseries from that. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, we had to operate basically in a, a pocket universe mm -hmm. that uh, that that uh, Frank Hanna created, and I'm I, I proud to call Frank Hanna my friend. He's a really good guy. Hey, here's a great question from Jason. Okay. Okay. Yeah, do you guys find yourselves wishing you could revisit the Ultraverse and make new stories and continue old ones, or is it so far in the past that you're beyond it all now? Oh, we talk about this all the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've never grown up. No. But, but, but like most actors will tell you, when they make a movie and then you ask them about the movie, they generally don't tell you about the contents of the movie. Mm -hmm. They tell you the experience they had making the movie. So even the worst movie, some actors have these really warm feelings about because they had a great time making that movie. And so I think Tom and Chris will agree that while we love the stories and we'd love to go back, mm -hmm. what we really miss is working with all the people that we worked with. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the camaraderie of the office and what we built and how we built it and all of those things. We miss those things, I think, more 
than the actual characters so much. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get back into it. I mean, if uh, is there ever a calling where maybe try it again or do you know? Or do you know a guy? Those lines? Do you know, you know a guy? If you, yeah, if you, if you, if you got somebody ready, ready, if you know somebody that's ready to write a check for a, a few million bucks, we're ready to go. We uh, we more run, than a few million. Yeah, we, we <laughs> run the, just, just to be clear, Dave. Let's not you know we we <laughs> not undersell. Well, we're just we, opening the negotiations here. All <laughs> you don't want to scare them away. We we run all this money, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> this much money. All this money I have on my. It's desk. so cold in here. Let me we burn do. this money. <laughs> I will offer you this many. <laughs> We need so at think, least ten thousand dollars. So I think I think that's, that's it. I'm sort of I'm sort of less <laughs> interested in revisiting the actual characters of that time than I am in trying to create something new based around the feeling that I had at that time. Yeah, that, and, that was actually more my question, Tom. And so I think that because the, the what I liked and I mm -hmm. would would certainly want to do it differently today is I just like building all these different teams of people mm -hmm. and sort of letting them run loose and um and then see what came out because the publishing comics is sort of like uh there's a scene in, in the war of the worlds movie with tom cruise where they're all waiting in town and this train rushes by and it's just on fire it's that, the only good scene in that movie yes oh come and, on jc but it's, it's not the only good scene in that movie that's that's Listen, sort of like that's sort of like other comic scenes book. The other scenes are so bad that it's almost not good, but it is. Now good. the scene where the bodies float by in the river is a good scene too. Yeah. And so, so I, I th well, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I talk too much. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, for me, I, I really, really, really loved the camaraderie, and I loved building up the teams. But I also had um, a deep interest in where we could go with it, like what we could, what we could do with those characters how those characters could interact sort of like that. Like I love watching MCU movies today because that's the feeling that I got when we were building the Ultraverse. Um, and we were kind of ahead of our time in some ways because we really wanted to focus on the writing. We wanted to keep, we wanted to keep things realistically interwoven and to try to keep this, uh, you know, continuity going, but not so overwhelming that it destroyed it, that it was so top heavy that it destroyed the stories. And I felt like, you know, um, we were a little bit more rushed than I'd like to. We ended up having to speed up uh, how many books we, we ended up having to deliver. Um, and I would love to do the, do it over again, but super high quality and characters that were relevant to this time as opposed to characters that were relevant to that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say, I would say that, you know, one of the coolest things about Ultraverse, which, which didn't seem like it was something that was happening uh, except for maybe in Valiant a little bit was, it was almost like all your characters knew, you know, like what was going on in the world. Like we tried hard to do like that. They, like, you know, when so-and-so happened over in this city, like it was mentioned in one of the other books, you know, whereas that, that's not something, you know, you can't have cities being destroyed in five titles at the same right. time, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, I thought you guys did an incredible job. And I guess like, I guess I would just ask, like, did you guys know that, that Marvel was going to shelf it or did y'all not really, you know, you're like, I'm selling it. Like I'm done. We were really new. So, so you got to understand the three of us were kind of newbies at starting a company. Malibu was at least in my, for me, it was the first company I was ever part of the founding team on. And we took a lot of things for granted. We just thought that, you know, that we were guys that were doing the best we could and that we weren't, you know, we were proud of what we had been able to build, but we kept thinking that there were other people out there that knew more than we did that were better than we were. Mm -hmm. Right. And that once we got to the big time, you know, they start making even better decisions. And what we found out was that wasn't true at all. We actually were pretty good <laughs> in comparison. And, you know, people didn't see, have any vision that bought us. They mm -hmm. didn't have uh, to be com completely frank. They, they just didn't have any vision about what, could what could be and then none of them were startup people they're all right. people that had grown up you know they used to say they could put wolverine on a on the back of a pen and sell a million of them why do we need you right yeah do you, do you think dc comics would have would have shelved it as well or do you think they would have used some well, it would have been different I, I, it, I would think. Have been, it would have been vastly different yeah i don't but know if it would have ultimately been different but but initially and for the first 10 years it would have been different but i think i I know the I know that it was eventually shelved, but Marvel did give us one shot to sort of rebuild and relaunch. And 
they gave us lower prices at a lower cover price. They gave us access to their printer. They yep. gave us access to some of their talent. They gave us access to some of their characters. And they put a lot of money, what they could, into a relaunch of the books. And then just what, what happened is that the sales of those books, the relaunch came at a time when the industry was collapsing as well. And the sales were very disappointing. And that was all the money and time and effort and energy that Marvel was right. going to expend on the Ultraverse. So it wasn't like, they bought the Ultraverse and shelved it. It was like they right. bought the Ultraverse. Here's your shot. That shot didn't work in the way that Marvel needed it to work. And so then it was just a slow yeah, uh, dissolve so into. It, it wasn't their fault. The, the, the business had, had, like Tom said, the business had collapsed. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I mean, sales had fallen by for, for non-Marvel and DC titles. Sales had fallen by what, guys? What, what would the percentage be from the height of the Ultraverse till like two years into Marvel? Well, you went sixty percent, seventy percent. Averages averages went down over fifty percent. Yeah, the average title yeah. lost fifty yeah. percent of its its readership. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, and what you had got, and if DC had bought the company, um, uh, we know this because Chris and I had a uh, breakfast meeting with Paul Levitz, and he had an actual vision for Malibu, which was that. Um, well, you'll find this hard to believe, but when DC was based in New York City, um, a lot of the people in the New York office didn't want to work on any other things except for the DC characters. And so, and which we understood, because if you get a job at DC and you're the Superman editor or the Batman editor and the Wonder Woman editor, you don't want to do a bunch of Warner Brothers comic books out of the California right. office that are based on video games or movies, because that's not why you got your job at DC. Right. Why would you apply it to DC Comics right. if you didn't want to work on DC characters? Right. Yeah. right. And so um, Paul had this plan, which is like, okay, the Ultraverse is going to be here, and then you guys will be my West Coast sort of DC office, but you'll do all the books that are still good comics that my guys in New York don't want to do because they want to do Batman, Superman, and Wonder yeah. Woman. Mm -hmm. We would have been and, great. And, and, to be fair, we would have been great at those books, right? Well, and, well, we Malibu had a, we had we had a history of being good at that stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean, yeah, right. I mean, very very few of our licensed books were clunkers. Most of them were pretty darn good, mm -hmm. and yeah, that was Bruce, also Green Silver Surfer was pretty good. And, and that, <laughs> well, I meant like Bruce Lee and oh, you know, oh I'm sorry I thought you were talking, was actually licensed. I thought you were talking about the license license. Books. my bad Mortal Kombat. I mean, and, and and Deep Space Nine oh yeah Mortal Kombat yeah, I like right. Mortal and Kombat. I just like to say, I just like to and say Robotech pretty good Robotech yeah, Robotech, yeah, yeah, Robotech, yeah, Robotech made us was our, was was our bread and butter for years it was it was a great book and uh, I just like to say you know. Rune Silver Surfer had a great cover. <laughs> <laughs> wow! It's, okay. literally, it's literally the worst John Buscema artwork to ever exist. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. Uh, he, was, he was definitely on. He was definitely on his way out already. I mean, but, but golly, you know, I mean, but Chris, I really want to ask this question, and I don't that know was the after way. My to, time, so. I don't know why. I don't know a way to do this without just being direct about it. Is Barry Windsor Smith crazy? <laughs> Listen, uh, Thank you. Good night. Uh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I loved working with Barry. Barry taught me um, a lot. Uh, it's the first. It, it was the first sort of like comic book star that I collaborated with. Sure. And and I, you know, I wasn't in the role of an editor with Barry. We were actually uh, co-writing and co-building up this character and this storyline. Um, and so, like, even how uh, he would add. Um, balloons he had a whole like process for how he'd do it and it was for in his mind the bal the balloons were intrinsic to the artwork it wasn't just like hey here's the artwork now go throw some balloons on top of it he for him those were just equally as important as any of the line work that he did and so, so that was kind of that was a little bit of an eye opener because we were pretty workmanlike about laying out balloons when we had you know when we were uh doing malibu so to sort of really go through seven or eight revisions on a page with with barry taught me a lot it actually taught me a lot i'm very grateful to to working with barry so that's what i, I think so I, I i would say no i don't i don't think he's crazy i think he's incredibly talented or i'd say he, he's crazy he talented he wasn't <laughs> no, it wasn't easy though answer. no I think, but, but but it was but it also he cared about the end result it wasn't about his ego mm -hmm. it, it was about what was on the page 
that's what he cared about when um, when I was working with him on Room. Yep. yep. I'm excited. I'm excited to hear that. Uh, honestly, I know uh, some pretty good firsthand stories from from other folks that prompted the question. Um, <laughs> But I'm on the other hand, even knowing that, I'm really looking forward to his book from Fantagraphics. So is that the sure it'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a he's a rare talent and uh, you know an amazing person. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like his his work on Eternal Warrior and Solar. I mean, mm -hmm. they. I mean, it 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 drug me in. Like uh, I thought it was awesome, and then I loved Rune absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, see, I loved Archer and Armstrong. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have a question in front yeah. of us, boys and girls. And uh, Heroin Burr uh, asks, uh, any thoughts on Straczynski and Lepresti's character Elvin as a 90s second wave feminist icon, given origin story, etc.? Oh. Oh, I see. This is... This it was is a, a good, deep, good comic, I mean. This is a deep dive into editorial, and I'm we're at the limits of my, uh, of my knowledge and my ability to hold information in my head. <laughs> I, I mean... Um, so we, we we edited and and came up with the comics in the '90s in the teeth of the image, you know, explosion. Absolutely. Uh, when when everything was about you know guys with tiny hands and giant heads and giant biceps and punching everything in sight, and it was hyper violent, right? There's a lot of hyper violent comics that were out at that time, and so we were trying to do stuff that had good like nutritional story value. Uh, all the way through the the line, we were trying to do story value. And Chazuski, I remember him always being someone that wanted to bring characters to life that maybe got short shrift in other comics or different types of characters. Um, and so Elvin was was one of those. But I also felt like we did that with Prime, with having you know a kid um, as as, but actually a, a younger kid, not a teenager, as part of it. And uh, we did that with Mantra, with you know with with being a, a woman in a man's body or a, sorry, a man in a woman's body. So we, we kept trying to do that, that stuff. And it was really about the characters. We want to bring the characters mm -hmm. to life, not just, not just posters of, of the same looking guy punching each other that could have been intertwined with a, with an X-Men character. But also um, I, I think oh, Elvin was actually, no, 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 you go ahead. I talked to him. Uh, uh, no, I want to hear about Elvin, but <laughs> I was gonna, the thing I was going to add to what Chris said was some of the things that damages, damage the comics content during the 90s was the fact that the, a lot of artists were drawing their pages for resale. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, when you're, drawing, when you're yeah. drawing an art, when you're drawing a piece of art for resale, there's not a lot of um, upside to drawing that dr picture of two people talking in a police station. Does this, yeah. right? Or, a, or, having, right. So or I, having dinner or whatever. And so we had to curtail those instincts even in the artists that we had. I mean, they were all really good about it, but that's something we had to watch out for. So and you can still have exciting stuff and make a good story out of it. I'm not saying you don't have those pinups or poster shots or whatever it is. It's just not all those poster shots. Right. But it, re but it really killed the idea of you're doing Tales of the Accounting Department. <laughs> I, I that's an, that's in the, uh, on page five hundred and five of the ultra response. Although although <laughs> although I'm still pissed off about my pitch for drunken accountant that never got it. <laughs> Tom, you bring that up every time. I I, I I I figured out a way to make it work. The numbers yeah, add up. You keep making money. Keep making money every time. That's <laughs> and, I, and I think all of us can agree on our admiration for the talents of a for Aaron Lepresti. Oh, absolutely! Oh, yeah, I don't. I don't want that to slide by without us getting a shot well, at I, that. I, otherwise, I can't have dinner with him every year. Right, <laughs> that's true. So, Tom, that, how many years? How many years have we had dinner with Aaron Lepresti in San Diego? We don't. And we this, don't even. We don't even talk about it anymore. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's a really <laughs> long time. And it's, have, yeah, the thing are about you guys, that, are you guys okay. going to be able to do to do one in twenty twenty? No. 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 Although no, Gary no, talked not. about it, he goes, "If you're willing to go to San Diego, I'm willing to go to San Diego." And I was like, <laughs> "Not I yet." Can't. I can't no, get across yeah. the border. Well, <laughs> as 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 I've as I've mentioned, my San Diego uh, could be if I flew to San Diego and had lunch with you three, and flew home. That's a trip. That's a trip worth spending. You know, if we had, I, 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 I'd do it. I'd love, I love it when John Jackson Miller joins us. I just want to need. I just want to name drop everybody I can think of. <laughs> you know, it's really <laughs> great. Well, and we had Conan, we had Conan Saunders from MyComicShop.com. That's right. There. Yeah, and and, uh, and yeah. Haynes, your buddy Mark Haynes. Haynes. Mark Haynes, Haynes and I think I think one time yeah. we had Joe James, who was at Defiant and Milestone. Yep. yep. And and as a uh, award-winning uh, 
storyboard guy now, and we have a we have fun at that lunch. Rosina even joined us. That's right. Is somebody killing a cat. What? What's going on? <laughs> that, so oh, can I say one is more that thing? Your about cat, Chris? Chris? It's Chris's yeah. cat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm muting it right now. The cat just comes over because he wants to talk to me. <laughs> that is, no, let it go. I love it. It's, <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, hey down here. So, um, you're I, I'm here in my garage, so it feels he feels like it's his place. So every <laughs> right. once in a while, he comes in and just yells at me to get Stop the using his litter box for Christ's sake. Like get off my computer. <laughs> you know, you know, when I asked if anybody else was interested in purchasing. Uh, you know the Ultraverse. I was I was very surprised to find out that Image didn't try to didn't try to pick it up. Like you would right. think that would Image, be a no brainer for them. Image is not a company in that sense, so Image yeah. doesn't Image doesn't collect money into a corporate pot and then go out and buy stuff and acquire stuff. They all that money that comes in pours back out to the individual creators, and so there isn't hmm. there isn't a corporate structure where they collect this giant profit, build up a war chest of stuff, and then go out and buy to expand. And yeah. so, um, it, it makes it, it in a wheel, it's an axle. That's why, that's why the studios went different ways, right? Right. And so, yeah. I think the so there's no, there's no central, <laughs> some poor dude, some poor dude, his, cat, his dog, his cat's talking to Holmes' cat. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lee. We're sorry. I'm sorry, Lee. <laughs> the cat keeps interrupting. No, that's not what happened. This is what really happened. So if you guys were to get back into it, right, and you're like, you know what, screw it, let's let's you know let's start creating new characters, a, a new universe, and that. Would you guys go the crowdfunding route, or would you try to to produce them in another way? I I would want a corporate master. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think I, you, I, you I want. Like, I would like the stability of knowing that that's not the part I have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Right. So I so I I bootstrapped two companies, actually three. Forgot about one of them, um, and it's it's just painful, right? To to not have the resources that you need in order to do be able to build the stuff, and and for us to do the Ultraverse required eleven almost eleven years at Malibu building up our war chest month after mm -hmm. month, after and we had some rough times, we had some tight times, uh, so I think if we were to do it all over again, I, I don't want to wait eleven years to have enough to do it right or to build something great. We want to be able to build it great out of the box. And for that, you need you need reasonable funding. You can so still do it efficiently, but you still need funding. Yeah. Sorry, so, Tom, here, go ahead. That's right. so here's what you here's what you've got. You can do four books a month for four years with four million dollars in your war chest, and that's before you have to turn a profit. And with that kind of stability, knowing that all your creators are going to get paid, knowing that your printer is going to get paid, knowing that you don't have to sweat about money as long as you stay on the budget according to the business plan, that takes a lot of the sweat off from the business side and you can just make books. You can hire the right people, you can get the right books out and you can focus on marketing and distribution and publishing and not have that sort of doom fist of money hanging over your head. It, and, requires, it requires some major discipline, which I'm, I'm sure that Tom and Chris and I are capable of, but the, the temptation to go off budget when you see the next shiny thing headed mm -hmm. your way is almost overwhelming. Well, mm -hmm. that, that, that's why you have to be focused on all the stuff Tom said, but but specifically with the goal of building a readership, right. building an exactly. ongoing readership and keeping the ret retention of those readers, not having them come and go and buy your books one month and then the next book it drops down to half, half and the next book after that it's half again. you got to basically service that group with service something that they audience. love that's and, right. keep, and keep <laughs> delivering. With today's, you know, with the with the yeah. state of the industry today, with the new mediums out there, you know, digital this, that, and other forms, do you think it would even be worth ever, like, if, if it ever came to maybe starting Malibu Comics again, would it ever be worth it? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, I guarantee it. Well, this, this, this is a venue that didn't exist to us. We didn't have a chance to do this. I'm convinced that if the times were different, We'd have had a YouTube channel before any of the other publishers because that's <laughs> they, what we they did. They would have had a YouTube channel. Definitely, I agree with that. Publishers. I, mean, I'd have been doing, I had been doing a Meet the Publisher show every Friday. Well, we had. Before. All right, I'm going to tell you a story about Dave and the fax machine. I think it's important that you guys hear this story. <laughs> I'm so not sure I, what this says about me, but I, I, it, I it don't says, like it says, it says that you're a visionary, Dave. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Dave, Dave heard about this new thing called a fax machine. 
and he's and he said, "Well, we we got to get we got to get one of these in so we can get our orders direct, and it's going to be you know much better." And I laughed at him. I said, "Dave, come on, we don't we don't need a fax machine. What are you talking about? We have we got two nickels to rub together. Why are we going to spend it on a fax machine?" He was absolutely right. Dave saw that 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 trend really early on, and I think six months after we got one, everybody had one, and the whole business had changed to delivering orders direct. Which was a big deal, right? It was a big change that happened almost almost right away. And the same thing happened with computers. We always had uh, we had email in 1986, right? Everybody connected by email in our in our office, and all of us had computers. So I I have no doubt Dave would have been a, a, a YouTube personality. Well, and we in so in 1992 1993 we actually had a video department. They had their own office. It was three people. It was Darren Doan. Yep. It was Ken Dario, right. and they had an assistant, Nikki O'Neill. And Ken Dario was the guy who co-created the um, uh, the Spickle Minions Me. franchise, the Spickle yeah. Me franchise. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they used to follow everybody around the office with video equipment, recording everybody 24-7. They would go to conventions and record everything. Yeah. Anytime a creator or a famous person would come into the office, you'd have to sit for five minutes and give Darren and Ken – some kind of, of spiel that they could work into a promotional video. So we were always, you know, if any sort of technology existed, somebody in the we office would grab onto yeah. it and try what to make would, it work. What I, would give awesome. that, what I would give for that footage, though. My oh, the raw God. footage yeah. of all of us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know where it went. It probably disappeared in a hard drive that went in the garbage somewhere. But, oh, my God. How good it's on eBay that right now for $600. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, it comes with a free Alteris Bible. I thought I thought you were going to tell the story about the fax machine where I went to went to war with UPS. I, I didn't want to make you out to be a crazy man, but if you I, want to tell I, that story, I, 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 I appreciate that. Oh no, 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 no! <laughs> he does have the beard, though. Maybe that's maybe that's the tease for number three. Yeah, for the third panel. Write, write that down, Niall. Dave's story about the yeah. UPS guy, but and he's crazy. But have him tell it. <laughs> have him tell it first before you invite me in, because I've heard it too many times. <laughs> That's great, guys. Well, we're that. We have about we've got about uh, fifteen minutes or so yeah. left. You got okay. any questions left there, Doctor Blevins, on your oh, sheet of paper? Absolutely. Yeah. Why, why, don't why was Nightman chosen for the TV series? Just because it was, I guess, I want to say the easiest to make. Yes, um, because we didn't choose it. Glenn, Glenn Larson Productions chose it. Right. And so it was the kind of thing where Glenn Larson has X amount of money in his budget to make an episodic TV show for syndication. And this is the thing. Given the technology of the time, this is the superhero show that you could do. Mm -hmm. And so, and, you know, was, nobody nobody could afford, and the technology didn't exist, to make, like, Prime or The Strangers right. or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Did, it was the same with Men in Black, right? They just chose that. We gave them all access yeah, to the all, of our, the all of our selection books. process was the same as Men in Black. Here's the catalog. What would you like? Right. Did uh, when, when that, did you know that it was going to be airing late at night like that, or or was yeah. that something we, that you know we, it was all no, of them? It was all of them. You had no no dealings had, at all with it. Yeah. No, no. They I just know. wrote us a check and sent us a first stuff for approvals. Yes. Did you, did you guys have any input on the the Ultra Force cartoon show? What we had, we had more. We had more. What we had <laughs> was that um, uh, there was a. It wasn't in the contract, but there was sort of an unspoken arrangement that Chris had set up with the Ultraverse founders, or I guess unwritten arrangement. It was it was certainly spoken that every chance we could, the original creator of a character could have a say in its exploitation as long as all the other partners were in agreement. So mm -hmm. the scripts would come in for Ultra Force and they were circulated to everybody because they were using pretty much everybody's characters. And um, you could make suggestions or comments. You had no control, but right. yeah, like like Mike Barr could say, well, Mantra's not going to say that. Or Mantra would say it this. Uh, well, the idea was that you can't just say no. My character won't say that. You have to say, my character would say it this way. So you you had to offer, so, offer a solution, not just a problem. Right. You couldn't. Yeah. yeah, you couldn't be. You couldn't be negative because the idea was, if you're too negative, then that avenue gets cut off. If okay. you want to be the the thing about Malibu is we tried to have this sort of team effort. Whereas if you see a problem, you can't just come into the room and say this is bad. You have to go into the room and say 
uh, I would like to do it this way and come up with the, the solution. Because it makes, it, believe me, it makes for a better office environment when you, uh, when you work that way. And I'm, oh. I'm guilty of not being in that office environment. <laughs> <laughs> did, <laughs> put that down for episode three, too. <laughs> did, the, did the toys come because of the cartoon or were there? Ah, we, we, yeah. talked about, we talked about this last time. The answer um, is both. <laughs> the answer is both. Because here's, here's the thing. In order to get a – because uh, Ultra Force was a non-network show, which meant it was syndication. And right. in order to get USA, a syndication right? – Right. And in order to get us, and it was done through Alan Bobot, uh, their corporation, and it was a partnership with Deke and it was a partnership with Galoob. And so in order to get a cartoon show done, um, the company that syndicates it, Bobot, has to have space and interest. And then Deke mm-hmm. has to want to produce it and have the money to do it. And then Galoob has to have an interest in making the toys. And so uh, the genius, the the peculiar and very specific genius of Scott Rosenberg is that he was able to go to all of these three people and make them think that the other pieces were coming into place. Nice. And so basically if you Galoob who would make the toys would put up a certain amount of the budget of every episode, if they knew a show was getting made and then the show would get made if there was a toy line coming to support the, the, the show, cause that might drive viewership. And then the distributor would be interested in if he knew there was a toy line and a show that was going to be in production based on these comic books that existed. So Scott was able to sort of go to all these different places on a repetitive basis and sort of inch it forward every step of the way. But you need you need all those pieces in play at roughly the same time. It's that whole job, it's all the whole really? job thing, right? You can't get a job without experience, but you can't get the experience without a job. It sounded like it was more like a, more like a, a parent thing. You know, it's like Hey Dad, can I go to the movies? And he's like, if your mom says it's okay, it's okay. And then, and then you go to the mom and you're like, Hey Mom, can I go to the show? Dad said it's okay. You yes, know? it's almost <laughs> exactly what it's like. It's except just like it's, the, it, it, go ahead, Tom. Except it's three hundred thousand dollars an episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your mom makes toys. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so. So, man, like, did y'all, I mean, did they come in and give you guys prototypes? Did you have any? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So here's, that, those are party <laughs> days. Yeah. So the what happens is that the, the I think Galoob is in San Francisco. And this was before the Internet really existed as a thing. And so they would do 3D sculpts of the, the toys. And they would send the actual model in a, <laughs> this very protective box down to our office. And uh, there was a guy, Hank Canals, who's now a uh, super president at DC Comics, or whatever. He was in charge of looking at it and saying, yes or no, this is good, this is bad, this is whatever. Um, but if the person who created the character was, was local, like Mike Barr or, um, or, uh, or Gerber um, or somebody else, they could come up and they could have a look as well because we had like a 24 hour or 36 hour turnaround time to get back notes back so if you happen to be in the office on that day then you could give notes on what would be your toy um and then it would go back to galoob and they would you know make adjustments re-sculpt or whatever and then it would become and then magic would happen and it would become a toy hmm. But when that stuff arrived, it was like all hands on deck in the in the conference room for the unpacking oh, yeah. of the boxes. Oh yeah, I don't know if you've ever. I've, I I it's hard to describe the feeling of where there's a thing that you're a part of, and the model for the toy is sitting on the table of a conference room, and you're just sort of you're sort of you're there to watch it. We, you could stare at it for almost hours because it's mm-hmm. it's it's the thing you don't really expect to have happen, uh, to a thing that you're a part of. So yeah, a, bunch of, a, have... bunch of, a bunch of us would stare, and then the people that didn't care that much would have little conversations among themselves. <laughs> right. do, y'all, do y'all have any? Do y'all have any of that stuff still left? Uh, I've got all the toys. Did, really, dude, that's awesome. In a, in a I don't box, have all of them. I have I have some of them. I, in fact, some of them are on the wall back there. I think. I have. I have, I have a lot of. Uh, stuff. I have a lot of stuff on that wall back there. <laughs> I have the. I have the prototype toy in its original packaging. Oh, is that Johnny Quest? I see Johnny Quest in that picture behind you. I, I, I do have a Johnny Quest. That's an original painting by Doug Wildey. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was the, that was the cover that Doug painted because Doug lived. 
just a few miles from the offices where we made Amazing Heroes. Mm -hmm. And so I went down there three times to interview him, did the interview. He did that painting for us. And then he just goes, would you like this? I don't, I don't have anything to do with it. So he signed it to me and everything. It's it's <laughs> one of my prized possessions. Are you kidding me? I yeah, I, awesome. I, I love it so much. And it and when so he great. when he dies, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's fantastic, gentlemen. I think that we've done a uh, a, a great job setting up episode three. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> for sure. I, and I, I, and I, I, I and, and I really I. I you know, personally, want to thank you guys for coming on again. I, I totally enjoy these conversations, yeah, and uh, and I think that uh, everybody else does too, based on the comments here in the chat. And uh, I'm I'm excited to do it again. So when we're ready, let's do it. Yeah, you guys, let us know. Yeah, yeah right. I'm excited. Uh, Nile, well, we're not going anywhere. I'm, we have to <laughs> have him on again. I got, I got, I got nowhere to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be here for months on end. So I'm just gonna wait. I'm just gonna wait here. <laughs> <laughs> That's really gonna hang funny. out. That's Touché, so sir. Well, <laughs> well played. Yeah. yeah, maybe we should get a, a Chris on one of our because me and Blevins are setting up some video game based uh, episodes. If you're ever interested, dude, I have uh, yeah. I have Prime on Sega CD. I have one of the sure. one of the actual full Sega CDs, not the not the double. Prime Microprose version. How, so, how great is that? How great is that Breifevel cover on that Dude, game? Though? Man, we That's, were talking about it. It's, it's, it's freaking breathtaking. Show, like, man, you the art they for that game incredible. cover is still just <laughs> yeah, knocks awesome. me out of my seat. Man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And All I, right, I, gentlemen. I, yeah. Oh, oh I, was just gonna, I was just going <laughs> to say. I was just going to say something more about the the Prime the Prime video game that I that I acquired today. And it was just, it was so good. And I'm thinking, like, at the time, like there were so, there were so many beat, there were so many beat em up at, at the time. Like, I right. think like, it would have been just a crazy good, good game. Like, I, uh, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's insane. And and the fact that it was on Super Nintendo, which doesn't have any of the stuff like Dinosaurs for Hire and all that was on Sega Genesis, Doom Troopers, all that, all that stuff was over on, over on Sega Genesis. And to know that it. There would have been something for Super Nintendo, and be finding it out today was. was <laughs> I actually just happened to have this next to me. Hey, look at that! Oh, there look it is. Look at that! There's yay! One of my, one of my favorite, oh, one of my favorite covers. Six hundred dollars on eBay. Oh no! I sent you a picture of this poster. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah! But before we go, just uh, that's that's that art by, that's art by Brian Carson. He uh, yes, it is. Did he did a two years worth of comic stuff and then went on to do something else? He does. I think it's video games. Does he do video games now? Yeah, he, he got out of the biz and went somewhere else. But yeah, his, his work, his work not, was terrific. We had Kevin Eastman on, and I keep. I this is one of the books I have displayed in, in my studio, and I and I had it with uh, some of the other stuff we we were just talking about, like uh, some of the. I don't know if you ever heard of the, you know, Kung Fu Kangaroo. Just some of the, sure, the yeah, yeah, interesting yeah, yeah, different yeah. type of books that were out there in the the uh, adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters and stuff yeah. and that's you know don with chin, that what's that that's don chin i think the adolescent it is. Yeah. yes yep. so, what, so what did what did kevin have to say oh no you're just saying how awesome all these books were yeah you know, we were just talking about it and i happened to pop up you know that i was a fan and i tried uh, to i tried to give my resume and he didn't take it <laughs> <laughs> like, well, come on. Uh, Look, my resume he doesn't know what he's missing out on i'm yeah, telling you that's a note. <laughs> But anyway, oh, so we got that image. Uh, yeah, again, I'm not sure if this about. is one for Malibu, but it was it was so crazy. That I don't even I know if this it. is appropriate, Blevins. Oh. Did it come up? Come on. Well, we see something there. Yeah. What are we looking at? Looks like, it looks like a comic book store or something. Some yeah, that's, 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 a the, poster. That's, that's from the Amazon show. Yeah, this, oh. is, this is the comic book shop from the... Where's her shirt? That what looks kind like of the has, Fury is this? It's like a metal. She has like a I metal. Think, metal I don't think if it, top on. I don't metal, think so. She's got a metal brassiere underneath yeah. that cape. I yeah, think. I don't think. Deal. I don't think that's ours. I don't think that's. I, the I didn't know. No, I don't think so either. Yeah, that looks like the back room of a comic shop for sure. Yeah. Like where yeah. they put all those comics, they're not going to sell you. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> on the. It's definitely the front. Like the guy comes in through the front door, and that's the. Yeah, that's, that's what he sees. 
Oh, he's got to do a better job. No, 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 no. It, actually, the the door when you came in the door, you faced the counter, and this is the this is one side wall, and it's like okay. a it's like a it's like a nineteen seventies New York comic shop where the rent was high, so the space was at a premium, so it's a really small shop. Oh, I see. And it smells yeah. like feet. It's angled, <laughs> Tom, it's angled, angled like a hallway. Tom. That's yes. a very, very nice way to put it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to say the wrong F word like my friend Dave does. Yes, oh, I heard that. Yeah, Dave. Oh, what? Oh. Did, I, did, did I do it tonight? You, you yes. Did. So you can you swear. Did. Please do. No. Yeah, what, I just what, did I, what did I curse about? Oh, no. <laughs> Everything. About <laughs> Norm Brayfogle's great art. Yes. yes. How effing good it was? Is that what I yes. said? Yes. Oh, geez. I just did it. I just, just crossed the line there at the end. Gosh darn it. Hey Dave, Mark Bourne in the uh, in the yeah. chat said you were said you were on his uh, cable access show or something in 1997. 1997. Oh, that wouldn't surprise me. Mark's a good dude. <laughs> <laughs> cable access that show. In 1997. <laughs> That's a classic Dave answer for almost everything. Well, it's like I'm pretty sure, sure it was me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I can't deny it. Obviously, a lot of drinking yeah. those days, but it could have been me. <laughs> Gentlemen, did this beard lie? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. Thank, thank, you, very thank much. you guys. It was it's a pleasure. An honor. Thanks yeah. for thank joining you for us. I think Thanks, Kyle. For... We really appreciate your your, your efforts, my friend. Yes, yes, Blevins, yes. Anytime think... you guys want to come on. I just uh, want to and... say I think Dr. Blevins filled in remarkably for Billy. Who well, as, as a matter of fact, I would like Billy to be gone permanently and Dr. Blevins. <laughs> <laughs> if that's, if that's okay. Wow. Guys, that's okay. Holy moly. Wow. And done. That's a, that's a brave, brave statement right there. A permanent stamp uh, now. You're now the it's, fixture, Blevins. It's a, yes. He, he's he's actually the uh, official Malibu Ultraverse sort of guy. Nice. When you, when you want to do this again, Niall, just send us an email. We'll figure it out. Well, we'll we do. Here. All right, gentlemen. Have yourselves Thanks, a great guys. night. And everyone, we will see you tomorrow Thanks, night guys. at 9 p.m. for a crowdfunding comic special with three amazing guests. So stay tuned for that promo. And everyone, have a safe night. Night, everybody. Bye. Good night, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.